All right, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to another edition of our uh, Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Tali, I'm from our education department, and uh, we're somewhere a little bit different today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a really interesting habitat today, or a home for a lot of, uh, of our different animals today, called a wetland. So this is what we're going to be learning about today, and I'm excited that you get to join us. Um, now, if you have any questions during our program today, if you're wondering about something, if you see something during our program that makes you go, Hmm, I want to know a little bit more about that. Uh, there's a couple of ways that you can interact with us. Uh, we have a number on your screen right, right there. Um, you can text us at 562-286-1838 uh, if you're watching this live or if you watch us at a later time and you still have some questions, you can email us and that uh, address is on your screen as well. And that is live at lbaop.org. So again, please feel free uh, to share your questions or your observations this morning. Um, now let's take a moment first off to talk a little bit about what is a wetland. What is that? Uh, and it's actually pretty simple. It, it, its name is named very aptly and it is basically land uh, that is wet or land that stays wet uh, for a really, really, uh, you know, a good amount of time. Um, so you can find these things uh, in salt marshes. You can maybe if you have a swamp near you or, or a marsh, those are examples of well and sometimes too uh, rivers will sort of overflow a little bit and there'll be little patches of land that stays wet next to them so those are examples uh, of what a wetland is or sometimes too um, a little bit more locally if a river kind of meets the ocean kind of where those two meet that can form uh, a wetland as well so that's a little bit about what we're going to be learning about today and all the really interesting animals uh, that call it their home and some of the important adaptations or things that's special about them that helps them uh, out in that type of home. Um, so wetlands are super important. This is kind of a big aerial view of like the Everglades here. You can see there is wet. There's definitely some water there. There is some land. So uh, so we, 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 uh, we got a good picture here. We got both, both parts of the wet and the land. Um, so they... Um, definitely can be really really close together uh, and they're super important uh, that kind of land uh, it's it's pretty mucky it's pretty muddy sometimes it's kind of smelly I've been to one it smells like rotten egg sometimes but it's super super cool and super super important um, that mucky land kind of uh, acts as a filter so the water will kind of pass through it and the land will kind of catch up all the little bits and bobs that maybe you don't want in there uh, sometimes it'll act like a sponge. If it rains really hard, you kind of kind of soak up some of that excess water. Um, it's also really important if we have big waves coming into the coastline, uh, if we have a big storm coming through, uh, those lands can help break down the power uh, of those waves and storms and help protect our coastline as well. So super, super important for our coastline, super important for us uh, in terms of the health of kind of the, the areas around there. You can see even here that you can, people would sometimes build really, really close uh, to wetlands as well. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later on uh, as well. But it's also really important um, for the, the animals uh, as well that live there. A lot of times uh, baby animals would kind of use that area as their nursery. Uh, a lot of times too for birds, it's a really important kind of resting or stopping spot when they're on a really long uh, migration. So again, really, really important, not just for us, uh, not for the not just for the animals that live there, uh, but for ourselves uh, as well. So let's talk a little bit um, about um, some of the animals I think that that live there first, and kind of see what sort of adaptations, what sort of special things do they have on them uh, to help them out uh, where they live. Uh, Miss and I wanted to say that also I have some friends to help me out here. So Miss Alicia is controlling all the awesome things behind me. Miss Allie is over at a computer. Uh, and she'll be delivering your questions to me. So I think, uh, ooh, thanks, I wanted to start off with some birds. Miss Alicia read my mind here. So this bird here is called a black net necked stilt. Um, what do you notice? I'll actually like fully get off the screen. There's something like hovering in the corner. <laughs> what do you notice about this bird here that can, might help it out in kind of their, their kind of marshy, wet muckiness that they live in? Um, so I noticed a couple things. I think the first thing that I find really striking um, are these really, really long legs that they have. They have super, super, super long legs. 
And they also have a super long, it's a little harder to tell in this picture here, but their beak is really long too. So these long legs are really important because they can wade into the water there to look for food, but then their body's not getting wet. So that's one good reason to have some really, really, really long legs when you're in kind of an area where you have a lot of water that not only comes in, that does have kind of tide sometimes. If you're near the ocean, you can see the tide uh, go up and down in these, uh, in these wetlands. Uh, but it helps them get pretty deep in the water, but their feathers are going to stay nice and dry. And then they have their really long beak as well, and that's going to help them kind of probe in the muck, probe in the sand uh, to look for their food. So sometimes they use them almost like, like a, a little tweezer to get in there and get some, uh, some crabs or some worms. I think maybe they can eat little, maybe little fish as well. Uh, but yeah, they can definitely um, poke their, their uh, bills in the sand to look for food. I think these might be some, maybe some avocets. So yeah, these are some other birds that kind of show you a little bit more what it looks like when they're in the habitat. So you have um, some friends that like to live right up um, kind of on the sandy bit. Some of them are going to wade a little bit further. This is a super cool bird over here. This is a heron uh, as well that uh, can definitely has some super duper long legs there. Uh, I can wade really far in and, and get lots of fish and stuff. Um, so yeah, they definitely have long legs and long beaks uh, to help them out, to help them wade into that water uh, and get their food. Um, one bird that has some actually really cool feet uh, is a bird called a snowy egret. Do we have a picture of their, their feet, Miss, Miss Alicia? We'll, we'll see if we can find one. So um, a snowy egret is a, is a uh, bird that looks a little bit, it's kind of in the same family as this, as this heron here. Um, and they have, uh, this is kind of what they look like. They have these really long um, kind of black legs here, uh, but their feet are like bright neon yellow. Uh, ah, there we go. So um, really, really, really yellow feet. Why do they have yellow feet at the rest of their body? The rest of their legs, I would say, are kind of a darker color. It just kind of looks like they're wearing yellow shoes almost. Uh, what they use these yellow feet for is they actually use it kind of as a lure. If you've ever gone fishing before, you'll have your little hook. You'll put maybe a little, uh, maybe you put an, uh, an actual worm on it. Uh, last time I went fishing, uh, they, they upgraded our technology and we had this orange goo that we put on as well. So you'll put something on there that might look appealing. Uh, to whatever fish you're trying to catch and they'll go ooh, what's that and they'll get over there and then hopefully you can catch that fish with your fishing pole right so the bird almost uses these legs here or these feet I should say like like little lures so they kind of look like little worm they'll cut kind of put them in the sand they'll kind of wiggle them around so the fish will be like ooh, is that a worm and they'll go a little bit closer and they'll go a little bit closer and they go a little bit closer and then they'll use their nice strong beak here, they go jump and they'll catch that fish. So that's how the egret uh, will get its food uh, using their super cool yellow feet. I think this is one of my favorite birds to find out uh, or to look for in the salt marshes as well. So it's really fun uh, to see these birds kind of interacting with their home uh, and eating a lot of food. Um, now I want to take a moment while we have some, some greenery in the area as well here that the plants at salt marshes are, are super cool as well. So they have to live in a really salty environment, right? A lot of times um, you'll have um, uh, places where you have salt water coming in from the ocean, meaning fresh water coming in from uh, a river. So you kind of have this kind of salty, kind of fresh um, environment to live in. So the plants have to adapt to that as well. Um, so I think we have some nice nice cord grass back here. But um, the, uh, there's a plant called cordgrass, and the plant has these little glands that sweat out the excess salt that's in the water to help them stay, um, you know, balanced inside and, and how they need to be. Uh, other plants have really long stems, so they don't get, kind of like the birds have really long legs, right? They don't want the important bits of them to get super duper wet, so sometimes they have a really long stem so they can hang out on the top uh, and not get completely covered. Uh, in water. So these plants have some really cool adaptations to help them out as well. Ooh, and I see we have um, some questions coming in 
about our snowy egret friend. So uh, James was asking, what do snowy egrets eat? James, that is an excellent question. So uh, they like to eat insects. Uh, sometimes they'll catch the little fish. Remember, we talked about that with their yellow feet. Uh, sometimes they'll eat worms. Uh, and sometimes they'll eat uh, crustaceans. They'll eat little crabs as well. So those are some things um, that the snowy egret uh, likes to eat. Thank you so much, James, for your question. And again, if you guys have any more questions about um, the wetlands, about uh, things you're wondering about, uh, feel free to text them in. And again, they got that number on your screen there. You can text in at 562-286-1838. So our birds definitely have some cool adaptations to help them. Oh, thank you, Miss Alicia, reminding me of another super cool bird. Uh, this is called an avocet. And their beaks are a little bit different, right? So our egret's beak is kind of long and straight. Our avocet's beak here is kind of curved uh, a little bit. And they use this um, as almost like a scythe. If you've ever seen uh, somebody uh, getting grain and they have a nice kind of curved blade and go whoosh like that, and they'll get the stuff off the top. So they kind of do that a little bit with the top of the water. So they'll use their little curved beak to go swoop like that. And they'll um, catch all the little um, the little guys that are uh, on the surface of the water as well. So they are definitely super cool. Uh, their beak is super neat to help them get their food as well. So some birds are using their beaks to catch food. Uh, some birds, like the egret, is kind of using their feet to help them catch the food as well. So yeah, they definitely have some really cool um, ways to help them. Oh, this is another one of my favorite animals. This is uh, a duck called a ruddy duck. Now, what do you notice about this duck that might be a little bit different um, than, uh, than maybe some other ducks you've seen on a pond or a lake? Hmm. I notice that this duck has a super blue beak right over there. So you might think, Miss Talia, did you color that beak in with markers before, before <laughs> we came in today? So this is uh, normally this duck's beak is black, but when it's breeding season, um, a lot of birds will change colors. And with the ruddy duck here, their male's beak will change this really super cool blue. So you only see this during breeding season. And that lets um, all the lady ducks know that, hey, I'm a healthy duck. Um, you should hang out with me. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, one of the ways they indicate that is with that super blue uh, beak. Now ducks feet are also super cool because remember they have to live in a pretty pretty wet place. Um, so you might know that ducks have webbed feet so we have kind of webbing in between our fingers here. Um, ducks are a little bit more a little bit more forward than ours are but um, they will use those webbed feet kind of like paddles to help them swim and then our duck here their feet are really far back. They're not kind of more centered like you might think of a duck so they actually look a little funny when they're up on land. They almost look like they're going to fall over sometimes, uh, but they kind of really, really waddle when they're up on land, but they're really, really good at swimming uh, in the water. Um, now, speaking of the water, let's look under the water a little bit too, and let's go look at uh, some other friends that call the wetlands or the salt marshes uh, their home, because it's not just birds and plants that are super cool in the wetlands. There's also some really cool friends that live under uh, the water as uh, well. So let me see if Miss Alicia can surprise me. Ooh, we got some fish. Uh, we got some fish swimming around. We got some perch and some other friends. My homework is going to be to figure out what this big silver fish is that just went behind me. Um, do you see another fish in there? The one that might be hiding? Hmm, I see an eyeball. Ooh, now my fish are going to cover me. Right there. There's an eyeball there. What? Wait a minute. There's something back there. And maybe even Miss Alicia and I were looking at this earlier. I think there even might be one in that other corner back there as well. Um, there are some flatfish in this picture. Um, and flatfish, like its name suggests, is a fish that is flat. Uh, and that helps it, like you saw in that picture, that helps it hide in the sand. Um, so what's really interesting about a flatfish is that it's actually born 
like a regular fish. It's kind of bodies like this. It swims like that. It has eyes on either side of its head. And then I think it's about a month or so in their life. It's very, very shortly into them being born. Their body changes shape. So their body flattens out. Uh, actually, they pick a side first. They pick the side or that side. And I've heard that there's fish that like certain species of fish prefer one side versus the other. Um, so they pick a side. They go on their side. Their body flattens out, but then, wait a minute, if you were a regular fish and you have eyes on both sides of their head and now you're like this, your eyeball is sitting in the sand. And that's not good, right? You don't want to have a scratchy eye full of sand for the rest of your life. Um, so their eye actually moves over to the other side of their head. So um, you'll have eyes on one side of their head and then their mouth's kind of looks a little bit sideways too. So you can see this one here, you got their little mouth here, and then you have one eye, and then you have the other eye right next to it on one side. So that way they can be flat on the sand, they can look around, and they don't have an eyeball full of sand. Um, and then there, I believe for the most part, they're gonna be kind of an ambush predator. And what that means is they're gonna sit really still and hide in the sand and wait. This is, I think, a tropical one. But another example of kind of what a little bit more what their body shape looks like. So basically, if you if you took a regular fish and you try to turn it into a pancake, that's a little bit uh, what this guy kind of looks like. Um, so they will lie really, really still in the sand, and they're gonna hope for maybe a little fishy, maybe a little shrimp, maybe a little crab to, crab to come by, uh, and then they're gonna kind of pop up and go oh, and eat it. Um, so that is how um, the flat. Uh, will eat, um, which is pretty cool, I think. They're a really neat little fish to find. And there's a couple different types of flatfish you can find out there. So you can find uh, halibut, uh, turbot, uh, sand dabs is, I think, another type of flatfish. There's a couple of different types that you can find uh, in wetlands, which are pretty cool. Um, now there's another, let's see, Miss Alicia can surprise me with something, but there's another uh, animal that I'm thinking of that's also a little bit flat as well. Ah, she read my mind. Uh, so we have um, rays that are another flat animal that lives in a, uh, a salt marsh as well. We have them locally uh, too. But you can definitely find them in salt marshes too. And um, they uh, also are a little bit unique in terms of the way their, their bodies kind of figure out. So they have a very flat body. Uh, but if you look underneath here, um, you have uh, their little mouth here, you have kind of little, little sort of almost like little nostrily things up here. But then you have your gills on the bottom of their body, right? Um, now remember that um, like regular fish and razor fish too, they're just kind of a special type of fish. They're going to be using those gills to breathe right now. Now wait a minute, think about kind of how we said the flat fish, you don't want its eye in the sand. If you're a ray and where you breathe is on the bottom and you're sitting on the sand, um, you don't want to breathe in from the bottom, right? Because you would breathe in all the sand and you'd be like, bleh, 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 bleh. that's not very good. Um, so they have something to help them out. Let me see if I can see it in this picture here. But kind of right, so their eye is kind of right there. And then right there, there's like a little hole. Um, so that is a little hole called a spiracle. And that's kind of like, if I took my nose off and I stuck it on top of my head, that's kind of what that is in terms of just a way another way that's helping me breathe so what they do when they're resting on the bottom um, so they don't breathe in the sand underneath them they breathe in through the top and out through the bottom that's how they'll able to kind of rest on the bottom and um, not have to breathe in sand um, now their mouth is super cool too their mouth um, is really really flat their teeth are really flat as well it kind of looks like if you smoosh your knuckles together that's kind of what their teeth look like. And they're kind of this really hard bony plate and they like to eat uh, things in hard shells. So they will eat um, um, clams, worms, crustaceans, crabs, things like that. They'll use those really hard plates to kind of smush them up. Ooh, I have some more questions coming in uh, from Joshua. Joshua is asking what other animals live in the wetland? Joshua, that is a great question. So uh, one of the cool things I think about wetlands is they are really what we call diverse. I mean, there's a lot of different types of animals that will all live kind of in one 
area. So um, some other types of animals that might live there. You're going to definitely find uh, a lot of different what we call invertebrates, so animals with no backbone. So those are all the wiggly, squiggly, wormy, squirmy things. So uh, you'll find all sorts of worms and crabs and snails and all sorts of little bits living in uh, the, the mud. There's definitely some cool um, worms uh, and clams. If you want to look up a gooey duck, those are really ridiculously big clams. There's something called an innkeeper worm. There's this little worm that uh, makes like a little burrow for himself. He'll kind of stick his head out of the top. Um, you can find small, uh, small mammals that will live nearby. Uh, you can find fish, you can find rays like we were talking about, all sorts of birds, frogs, reptiles, bugs. You can find so many things at wetlands. So um, if you ever, uh, I do encourage you guys, if you have one nearby, um, check them out. They're really, really, they, they don't look very pretty sometimes at first, but they're super cool. Uh, um, they uh, can find all sorts of friends uh, living, uh, living just by, by sitting and watching for a bit. Um, these are a bunch of birds that are kind of traveling to this wetland here. That's another important thing. I'm not sure if I mentioned that when we're talking about how important they are in the beginning is that, um, a lot of times birds will use these nice big open spaces as resting spots. So we have birds that travel, uh, over continents that travel from, you know, one side of the country to the other. And that's a long trip. You want to take you want to take a break every once in a while. So sometimes they'll use these wetlands as sort of a as sort of a pit stop, as sort of a rest a rest stop. If you've ever been on a long car ride and you're like, I need a break. I need to stretch my legs. So um, these these birds will stop in the wetlands, uh, take a break, take a snack, you know, kind of get ready for their next leg of their journey, uh, and then travel on uh, further to their destination. So again, wetlands super 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 uh, important to um, all sorts of different animals, again, as a resting spot, as a nursery uh, for babies uh, to kind of have a nice safe space to grow up into until you get to a certain size and then they'll go off to their next adventure. So um, really, really, really interesting um, place to be. Um, let's see what Miss Alicia is going to surprise me with. Next. Oh. I, I hear, oh, babies. Okay, babies are coming. These are um, avocet babies. So we had some avocet. Uh, remember the bird with a little swoopy beak like that? These are what uh, their babies look like. So they're kind of hanging out here. Actually, are these are still babies or are these are avocet babies? Avocet, okay, I was right. I second guessed myself. Ooh, and you can actually see those kind of beaks in action. So the kind of probe uh, with that beak there uh, and then uh, kind of swish around. These are the grown-ups. This is, these are what they look like. When they're grown-ups, these are what they look like when they're babies. And they're adorable. Mm -hmm. So again, a lot of baby birds, baby fish will kind of grow up in the wetland. Nice safe space for them to be in. Ooh, taking a bath. Feather, feather hygiene is also very, very important for, <laughs> for animals uh, as well. So again, super, super important place. Um, to, uh, for many, 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 many different types of animals. Now you might be wondering, what are some things um, that I can do to help out the wetlands? Um, one of the one of the easiest things you can do is like learn more about them. Because a lot of people, um, you might have noticed in some of our earlier shots, um, people will kind of build really, really close uh, to wetlands a lot of times. Um, sometimes they'll even just pave them over, right? Because they don't realize how important uh, they are. Um, and uh, unfortunately in California, uh, I believe we've lost about 90% of our wetlands um, due to um, development uh, in those areas. Now there have definitely been some, some um, changes in terms of trying to bring wetlands back to certain areas because people are learning more about them, realizing, oh, if we have wetlands, maybe that'll help with storms or big rains um, in, in my area. Uh, maybe it'll bring wildlife back. Maybe it'll improve. Uh, the quality of the water in that area, because remember, it's acting sort of like a filter as well. So learning is a great first step. Um, and uh, another way to help is just to make sure that our trash uh, doesn't get into areas like this as well. You might have seen um, near uh, near gutters, you'll when there, there's that kind of hole in the gutter, you'll see that sign that says leads to the ocean. A lot of these wetlands are kind of part of that watershed where you have 
uh, water that's coming up from the mountains, down through the cities, down through the streets, down through the gutters, down through the rivers, and that river eventually is going to get out into the ocean. And sometimes they pass through places uh, like wetlands. So um, that's another really easy way to help. But I think even uh, sometimes local wetlands have cleanup days. I know I've, I've been a part of, of one or two of those uh, in, in my past. So that's something to look into as well. If you want to like really get messy and muddy and go help out uh, with wetlands as well, that's definitely a, a very hands-on experience to, to uh, you will not forget the smell. <laughs> um, it's a really cool uh, way to, to, to get involved with nature and to help out uh, as well. Ooh, I have another question in. Uh, Dana is asking, what is your favorite wetland animal? Ooh, that is a great, great question. Um, I'm going to have to think about this. I think I was, I'm going to go with the snowy egret still because I love their feet. Their feet are really cool. I think that's a really unique adaptation that they have to help them get their food. So I really like the snowy egret. Um, there's definitely some super cool in, invertebrates in there. I like the innkeeper worm uh, as well. I think that's another one of my favorite uh, really obscure <laughs> wetland animals. But yeah, I think in terms of like overall favorite, I think the snowy egret um, is, is definitely one of one of my favorite animals just because of those super cool feet. Um, so yeah, those are definitely uh, some ways you can help out uh, with our wetlands. So I hope you guys um, have started to, to learn a little bit more about this habitat that maybe you didn't know about uh, as much uh, before we got started today. I hope I've introduced you to maybe a new type of habitat and it's kind of, it might be even a local one too. So I encourage you um, to take a look. Maybe see if you can find some of those wetlands maybe near, if you have a river uh, nearby or a creek or a marsh sometimes, uh, you could find those places uh, even in your backyard. And I encourage you um, to take a look and see what types uh, of animals and, uh, and things you might find in there. So it's a really, uh, really cool place to again, um, find uh, a, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, different types of animals. Uh, remember we were talking about we were finding uh, birds, we were finding uh, all sorts of things about different types of fish. There's perch, there's flatfish, there's rays. Um, maybe you could even find, you could probably find maybe a shark in there. Maybe if it was a little bit more on the, the oceany side of things. Uh, mm -hmm. There definitely can, can find some sharks in there. Oh, that's right. Uh, Miss Alicia reminded me that sometimes uh, remember we talked about babies. Sometimes you'll get baby sharks in certain areas. There's a place in, uh, I believe it's La Jolla, where leopard sharks will uh, will come and. Ooh, and she's she just told me that you can find baby sharks in a uh, local wetland we have here called Balsa Chica. So we definitely found uh, baby sharks before. Uh, all sorts of different sort of uh, invertebrates and things that like to live in the mud. All sorts of different awesome plants as well if uh, if the uh, the green things are or more your thing uh there's some super cool uh plants uh to find there as well and definitely um again really really important uh for our habitats uh for our coastline um again kind of acting as that filter acting as a sponge to soak up extra rainwater uh helping out with uh waves coming in helping out with storms uh a really important nursery um for a lot of different babies uh, and a really important resting stop for a lot of different uh, migrating animals as well. So um, I hope you learned uh, a little bit more about this super cool habitat. Um, and again, if you have um, any questions um, after the program, you're welcome to email them in uh, as well. So I'll put that, that email address up on your screen there. Uh, and again, if you have any more questions, if you saw anything during your program that you want to learn more about, um, feel free. Uh, to email us at uh, live at lbaop.org. Uh, so again, hope you guys uh, learned a little bit more about this uh, really amazing habitat. I'm really happy that I got to share a little bit about them uh, with you. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your morning. We have one more class coming at 10 o'clock. So if you want to stick around for that, you're welcome to. I believe we're learning about food webs, food chains. Yes, cool. Um, so please feel free to, to, to come back Stick around, but if not, uh, enjoy and uh, have a good rest of your day. Bye, everybody.